IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I am streaming to you live from beautiful Budapest in the heart of Europe. I hope everybody is having a fantastic week thus far. Hi, Hikmatillo, Diru. Good to see many of you in class. You're fun. Carolina Sanyo, fantastic. Lots of students joining in on time. And as usual, this lesson is brought to you by GIELTSHelp.com for general IELTS. Check us out there. Join our premium package for the academic version of the test. Check us out at aehelp.com. On both of those websites, we have lots of materials for you to study from, improve your English, your communication, and hence your IELTS band scores. These are proven strategies. They are the same strategies that all of us here at our company would use when we sit the IELTS exam. What we teach, we practice. If you haven't already, get our app, Academic IELTS Help, from your Google Play or Apple App Stores. And if you have questions, don't hesitate. Send me an email, adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at aehelp.com. As well, you can get our exam book. So today's listening uh, section practice is coming from our first exam book. Uh, it is sections three and four from test number two. We have six original practice exams. You can, of course, get those on our website in computer-based and paper-based versions. You can also order the books from Amazon. Just search for AE Helps Academic IELTS or GE Helps General. IELTS. This listening is a section three and four continuing from last week when we did section one and two. So if you still have your marks from last week, great. After today's class, we can add up all of your scores and see your band score. So that will be great. Hi, Zainab. Good to see some members in on the class as well. Okay. Uh, let's do that. So let's just jump over to our section three. For those of you who do have our books, this is test number two. So it's CD two track three in the audio. All right. So I'm going to play the audio for this listening section. Now this is listening section three. So it's a bit more challenging than section one and two. You have to be careful, uh, pay attention to uh, the paraphrasing and the inferred answers. And we're just going to warm up by doing section three. I'm going to darken up the screen here a little bit so you can see some of the brighter questions better. Okay, oh, that should be pretty good. You won't see me, but you don't need to see me because you'll be looking at the questions here. Um, students, uh, please, please, please write your answers on a separate piece of paper or uh, in a document. Don't put it in the chat. Give everybody a fair chance to answer these questions on their own. So this is our academic IELTS website here. I'm just going to click my student account and get into the my student account page. Then uh, I'm going to open up my audio CDs. And this is for exam two. So it's CD two track three. Uh, students, if this is quiet for you, please try to use a headset. Turn up the volume on your side. I am on max volume on my side here. So uh, adjust volume on your side and uh, use a headset if it's quiet. Okay, students, so again, don't share your answers. Wait until the end. We will go through the answers together. You will have a chance. Here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a student and her professor talking about their class.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in, Laura. Thanks a lot for making the time to see me, Professor Gorman. As I mentioned in my email, I've been very ill this past week and missing the first week of school was not a good way to start the term. Indeed, it's not a very good start at all, but I think you can overcome it. You had a good grade in my course last term and I'm sure this absence is just a bump in the road as far as this term goes. Now, what would you like to discuss? Well, I don't even have a syllabus, so maybe you could give me one and then we could go over it in some detail. Yes, that would be sensible. Let me grab your syllabus. Here you go. As you see, the class meets each Monday and Thursday from 10 to 11.30 in room A313 of the Juliet Building. Do you know where that is? Yes, the Juliet Building is right next to the Student Union Building, correct? Yes, that's right. OK, so next are my office hours. I hold them each Monday and Wednesday from 2.30 to 4 in the afternoon. If these do not work for you, feel free to send me an email and we can make arrangements to meet at another time. Now, let's discuss the books you'll need. As you see on the syllabus, there are two books you'll need for this course. You need not purchase either of them, however, as there are several copies of each available in the library. I like keeping my books for future reference, so I would prefer to buy both books. Are they available in the bookshop? The first one is, but the second one must be purchased from Buster's Books. Do you know where Buster's Books is located? Roughly, but do you have an address? Yes. The address is 3419 Young Street in Brighton. Right, I know where that is. Do you know how much the books cost, approximately? I think the one at the University Bookshop is about £20, and the one at Buster's is about £15. So that's a total of £35 for the two of them. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Great. Can we talk a little about the coursework required? Of course. There are two essays, one midterm exam and one final exam. Wow, that's a lot of coursework. Yes, but at this level I don't believe in just having one essay or one final exam determine your entire mark in a class. I like arranging it so that a student can have a chance to reflect on their ability and understanding of materials throughout the term. That makes sense. So what are the percentages associated with each assignment and exam? The first essay is worth 15%, the second is worth 25%, the midterm exam is worth 20% and the final exam is worth 40%. Would you like to talk about the first essay? It is due next Friday. Yes, could we? Of course. The essay should be approximately 1,500 words and the topic must be chosen from the list. And can I get a copy of the list? There is one attached to your syllabus. Right. So do we have to tell you what topic we are writing on beforehand? No, it's all right. You only have to notify me if you want to do a topic that is not on the list. Right. Is the essay due in class or can we submit it by email? I will accept essays without penalty until midnight after the class it's due. So yes, you can submit it by email, hand it in during class or submit it to the department office. If you submit it to the office, make sure to get a timestamp put on it so that I can be sure the paper was submitted on time. And also, be sure to make... That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and use that half minute to check your answers. And also that last question might take a bit more time. Just going to stop the audio on the website here real quick. Get back to the questions. I'll brighten the screen a bit so you can see me. And then we'll go through these together, okay? So...
Hopefully that wasn't too, too dark for you. You can see the questions. There, uh, there, let's see, for this first one, I'll brighten it up so you can see me. There I am, hi, Dylan. All right, um, here we go. So let's go through these together. Uh, question 21. Um, why does the student go to see the professor? Is it A, she's been in the hospital, B, she has been ill, or C, she registered late? Wellington says B, Sal says B, Zainab says B, Wellington says oh, she's been ill. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, she has been ill. She said I've been sick. So the correct answer is she's been sick. She doesn't say that she's been in the hospital, so we don't know that. Make sure not to assume. So the correct answer for 21 is B. Uh, I recommend using the capital letter in your answer sheet, so just put a big letter B and you are good to go. All right. Now, the next question was this fill in the form. It's a little bit brighter on the background, so I'm going to have to darken the screen a bit for this one. You can see it clearly. There we go. That should be good. Now, when uh, you're looking at these questions, okay, this first column, what does that represent? So before we answer, what does the first column represent in their speech? And this is really important when you're practicing at home. Okay, so this is my first tip for today. So strategy for fill in the form or fill in a form. Okay, pay careful attention to the provided information. Usually, the first column gives ideas about the what. So, this first column, class times, locations, we'll get to this one, required books. Uh, what is that? So what is, what are these pieces of information? Okay. And hint, hint, uh, for our regular students and our members, this is the same concept as when you're identifying two parts of your task two. Carolina says they're your nouns. Yes. And more specifically, Carolina, they are the what part of, that's right, Yvonne. Very good. They're the topics of discussion. So these are the topics. So when I see these, I know in my review time that these people will talk about class times, locations, another topic, required books. So these are all the topics. And if these are the topics, then these must be what? Because usually when we talk or write, we talk about the topic first and then talk about the, Hikmatillo says the theme, the content, the details, think task two, the what? Details or more specifically, even more specifically than descriptions, Ifran, we are talking about the controlling ideas. Okay, it's good to have these clear in your mind. So column one, topics. Column two, controlling ideas. All right, think about it that way. So these ideas are in relation and control to the topic. All right, when you gear your mind in that way, it finds it easier to identify such information. So usually the first column gives ideas about the topics for discussion. And the second column about the controlling ideas. All right, so keep that in mind. That's a valuable logic to bring into this, okay? All right, so here we go. Uh, class times, they meet something and Thursdays. When do they meet? What's the other day? I saw some of you give some answers. 
Uh, Abdul Bori, you have the right idea, but the wrong answer. Uh, Saul, you have the right answer. So everybody who's writing Monday with a big M, you are correct. Okay. Uh, Monday with a small M, this is wrong because that is wrong. Uh, days of the week, just like months of the year, are proper nouns in English. So you have to write it with a big M. You can also write it all capital. Okay, and you can write it as an abbreviation. But in every case, the M must be capitalized. Keep that in mind. All right, uh, location. Something building, room A313. Which building will this class be held in? Saima, Charlie, Kleber, Raghu have all the correct answers. It's the Juliet, like the famous Shakespeare play, Romeo and Juliet. So it is the Juliet building. Very good, Juliet. It's a well-known name in English, Spanish, French, Italian. So you have to get the spelling right on this one. Again, capital J, very important. There's two ways to spell it. This is the French way. Both are okay. They'll take both. Okay. All right. So it's not Julia uh, Zaid because Julia is a different name. So Julia, this and this are not the same. So those are not the same names. Okay. And they repeat this twice. So the man says, we will meet in the Juliet building. And then the woman goes, yeah, the Juliet building. I know that building. It's the one beside um, the student union building, right? So, okay, number 24. It's the next one. This is a topic. Um, it's on Monday and Wednesday for the professor. And these are the office hours. That's right. It doesn't have to be capital. It's okay if you do. Okay. Okay. Um, the O, if it's capital, it's okay. But even if you write a small O, it's still okay. It's, it's not a proper noun. It's just a common noun. So office hours, big letter, small O, it's fine. Okay, looking good. Okay, let's keep going. Let's uh, look at uh, the rest of this first half, and then we'll look at the second half. So here we go with the books. So they talk about the books, where to get them, how much they cost. Um, book one is available at the bookshop. How much does it cost book one? Okay, Charlie says 20, Sal says 20, uh, Saima says 20 pounds, but you don't need the pounds because we have it here and you might get that marked wrong. So just the number 20. Okay, when you see the symbol for pounds, you don't have to write it. If you don't see the symbol, don't write the word pounds. Please just use the symbol for pounds, okay? So use it like this if you don't see it, all right? Uh, if you write the word pounds, you might misspell it. Something might go wrong. So the symbol is easier. Just make sure that the symbol comes before the number, okay? So just the number 20 here. Okay, use the number, not the word. Use the number, not the word. Uh, book two is available where? Now they say this answer before this one and after this one. So they say it both before and after question 25. So book two is available at something books. Maxim is definitely not bastard books. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, bastard means that someone doesn't have a father or doesn't know who their father is. So it cannot be, okay? It's Buster's books. And Amar Wadi has the correct answer. So it's Buster's big B. Buster's uh, books with um, the apostrophe S to show possession, or you could do it as a plural. They'll take both. Buster's books like this is correct. Buster's books like that is correct. Um, the B has to be, again, a capital letter, a big B, because it's the name of a bookshop. 
And the way you know that, okay, so be very careful when you see that this noun, see how books, see this B? You see how that's a capital? Okay, uh, pay attention to that. If you see a capital letter on the common noun, that tells you that this has to be a capital letter as well. Okay, it's like when we say Pacific Ocean. The O is capital. So if you hear that, you know, there's a missing word there, then you know that this first letter here has to be a big letter P because this O is big. So that means that this whole piece is a name. In English, if the common noun is part of the name, then both the common noun and the preceding noun have capital letters, okay? That's a really important tip to keep in mind. So if you see in the blank that that's a big B, that should immediately be a sign to remember that that's a big B, okay? Um, Hadi, this is an example of an actual IELTS exam, okay? So a real IELTS exam is exactly like this one, exactly. Difficulty, question, format, and so on, all right? Okay, so again, 20, Buster's Big B. And then you had a little bit of a break, so you have few more uh, seconds to review the next questions. Uh, coursework, first essay, 15%. Second essay, how many percent is the second essay? And I see a lot of people already jumping ahead. Yes, to Guldor, capital letters matter in the IELTS exam, and they matter in English. If you don't use capital letters correctly in English, it looks really strange, okay? Um, yes, this is 25. Simple math, right? 15, 25, 20, 40, all together equal 100%. Use logic, right? If this is 15%, that's 20%, that's 35%, plus 40% is 75%. 100% minus 75% equals 25%, so this has to be 25%. Now you have the percent symbol there, so you do not need to add that. Logic will help you, okay? It's clear. Um, first essay, second essay, midterm, what's left here for number 28? Vijaya abdul Bori. That's final exam. I mean, only the final exam is left. And you have to write final exam. It's two words. You can't just write final. If here you write final, it will be wrong. Okay, this is wrong. You have to have final exam. Why? So why do you have to have exam here to get it correct? So if you write only final, then it's wrong. Why, why is it absolutely, what's the logic? Why is it absolutely necessary to have final exam? So again, be careful. Some students on this test, they just wrote final and they got it wrong. Not just because, Carolina says, because final alone doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, exactly. Even though we sometimes say final, it could be a final essay or a final project. So it's unclear just when you say final what you're referring to, okay? Even though in English we will say my finals are coming up in December. That means your final exams. We know that. But in the IELTS, you have to be very careful that your answers are clear, right? So final exam. Okay, let's take a look at the last two questions. Okay, so always use your brain, your logic. The IELTS exam is, somebody yesterday wrote me a, an email and said, Adrian, I think the 
IELTS is not just an English test, it's also an IQ test. And yes, in many ways I would agree that the IELTS is a type of IQ test as well. Okay, here we go. Um, write no more than two words and or a number for each one. How long should the first assignment be approximately? So how long should that first assignment be? Raghu says it should be 1,500 words. That's the correct answer. Okay. Um, if you have only 1,500, that would be wrong. You have to have words as well to be correct. Same reason as a final exam because it could be 1,500 characters. Right? So there are different ways to interpret that. In the question, it doesn't say words, so it doesn't say how many words, so it's unclear from just the question. So you have to have 1,500 words. Okay, good. So pay careful attention, especially in section three. If it seems really easy, it might be a little bit more than meets the eye to the question. Okay. Here we go. Uh, the student's class ends at 11.30 a.m. on the day the paper is due. Decide whether the paper is hand, uh, whether the paper, whether a paper handed in is on time or late. Okay. Write the correct letter A to B next to question 30. So on your sheet, you have question 30. And here you have to write A or B. A, the student receives a late penalty. B, the essay is on time, no penalty. So number 30, the paper is handed in at 5 p.m. the same day, dropped off at the department office with no time stamp received. The essay is on time, no penalty, or the student receives a late, pen late penalty, A or B? And the correct answer is A. The student gets a penalty. Why? Maybe uh, one of your fellow classmates will tell you instead of me. I'm Ardeep. My name is Adrian. That's right, Paranje. No timestamp. Yeah, no timestamp. Always be very uh, uh, cautious of these uh, negative words and these types of inference questions. Okay, this is called an inference type question. An inference question is where you get the answer by understanding multiple parts of the audio. Okay, so this is our second strategy for today. This type of question, there's uh, 11 different types of questions that you can see in the IELTS listening. We talk about all of them and the right strategies in our premium course on our websites. So this is called an inference type question. Okay, you must understand multiple parts of the audio and infer the answer from the information that you hear. Okay, now for this type of question, Pay careful uh, notice to the specific topics or subjects that are discussed. So pay careful attention to the specific subjects that are mentioned in the audio and the question. So here we're talking about the subject timestamp. Okay, so you have to listen carefully for this information about the timestamp. And uh, here the uh, professor says, make sure to get a timestamp so that I know it was handed in on time. So the paper is handed in at 5 p.m. the same day, dropped off at the department office with no timestamp received. Even if you didn't catch this, right? Again, use logic. 
So if I'm the professor, okay. So if I'm the professor, then how do I know that the paper is on time if I don't have that timestamp? Okay. I simply don't. So why would it not get a late penalty? Of course it would get a late penalty, right? Because there's no way for me to know when that paper was dropped off and if it was on time or not. So logic could also help you there. All right. Keep that in mind. Okay. With these inference types questions, use your logic, pay attention to the subjects that are discussed. All right. And also I spent a little more time on it. You probably realized that I paused at the end to think about that a little bit more. Think about this logical sequence, right? Ask questions. If I'm the professor, how do I know that a paper is on time if there is no timestamp? I don't. So what will I do? Give a late penalty, okay? All right, um, students, I see some of you are asking questions and I can't get to everybody's questions, but again, um, you can send me an email if I don't catch your question. Uh, remember that you can always send me an email. Again, for those who joined late, my email is adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at aehelp.com. Now, let's do listening section four for this audio. So listening section four. Uh, the same way as listening section three, please wait until the end to answer the questions together. Okay, so uh, put your answers on a separate piece of paper while you're listening. Don't put them into the chat. We'll go through them together at the end. Okay, um, again, my audio is maximum. So if it's quiet for you, turn up your volume or use a headset. Here we go with listening section four. Everybody's ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a lecture about the dinosaur Tyrannosaurus rex. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, class. If you are registered for Anthropology 322, you are in the right place. Today, we will be talking about the most famous of all dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, or T-rex, as it is commonly referred to. This dinosaur has a fearsome reputation, mainly due to popular culture films and books. In this class, we will be discussing the facts regarding the Tyrannosaurus rex, as opposed to its Hollywood depiction. Tyrannosaurus rex lived from approximately 80 to 65 million years ago. Of course, the reason it died out 65 million years ago is the same reason all of the dinosaurs died out at that time, a massive asteroid which hit the earth and destroyed almost all life. The period in which the Tyrannosaurus rex lived is known as the Late Cretaceous period. This reality is in contrast to fictional portrayals, which often cast the T-Rex as living in the Jurassic period. In fact, T-Rex did not come to be until 65 million years after the end of the Jurassic period. Tyrannosaurus rex was a meat eater, but it is not entirely clear whether it killed its own prey or if it merely scavenged the prey of other dinosaurs. In our minds, we imagine T-Rex fighting to the death with other dinosaurs, but it is not known for sure whether this is the truth. 
Tyrannosaurus rex was a large dinosaur, not nearly the largest, mind you, but still large by any standards of modern day wildlife. The dinosaur's length was approximately 12 metres, its height could reach 6 metres, and it weighed anywhere between 5 and 7 tonnes. That weight is the equivalent of about 80 average sized human beings. If humans had been around back then, we would have been the perfect size for an afternoon snack. The location of T-Rex fossils discovered is very interesting. They have been found in Western North America, as far south as Texas and as far north as Alberta. And they've also been found in Eastern Asia, mainly in Mongolia. How is this possible? How can fossils be found in such different regions of the world? The answer is what geologists call continental drift. The continents have not always been in the same location. They have shifted and around the time of T-Rex, Western North America and Eastern Asia were connected. This explains perfectly the discovery of the fossils in the different locations. One of the more well-known interesting facts about Tyrannosaurus rex is that it had extremely short arms. They measured only about one metre long, which is very short when you consider the size of the dinosaur. To put such small arms in perspective, it would be as if humans had arms that measured only 10 centimetres. What use would they be? Well, that is one of the questions that has led scientists to believe that T-Rex was a scavenger and not a predator. It is very difficult to believe that it could have been an effective predator with arms being so important for hunting. Another fact that leads scientists to believe T-Rex was a scavenger was its extremely strong sense of smell. This enabled T-Rex to smell carcasses over long distances, giving it a big advantage as a scavenger. On the other side of the argument, T-Rex had very large serrated teeth which would have been perfect for tearing through the tough skin of other dinosaurs. If T-Rex was a pure scavenger, it may not have required such teeth. Another interesting point about their teeth was that they were replaceable over time. Unlike humans who grow only two sets in a lifetime, T-Rex's teeth could be replaced over and over throughout a lifetime. Again, this is evidence that they were, at least in part, likely predatory. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And again, viewers, make sure to use that time to check your answers. Just stop the audio on our website and we'll come back and look at these questions together. Go through them one by one. Let's look at question 31. So this is where you have to match the uh, letter to the correct series of events. It's a type of multiple choice. Uh, which of these events happened 65 million years ago? You had to understand several pieces of information. So number one, dinosaurs became extinct. Tyrannosaurus came into existence. Tyrannosaurus rex died out. A large asteroid hit the Earth. Is it A, 1 and 3, B, 1, 2, 3 and 4, so all of the above, or is it C, 1, 3 and 4? Again, logic will help you. Many of you are saying it's C, um, 1, 3 and 4, and you're correct. And that makes sense, right? So in your answer sheet for 31, you would put C. Uh, dinosaurs became extinct. Tyrannosaurus is a dinosaur, so Tyrannosaurus rex dies. Extinct means to die out completely. Okay. If there are new words like extinct, make sure to add them to your vocabulary list. Um, and uh, a large asteroid hit the Earth. Now, Tyrannosaurus rex came into existence uh, possible but unlikely. Uh, bonus question. When did Tyrannosaurus rex come into existence? How many years ago did the big T-Rex first veer its beautiful large head on planet Earth, according to our fossil records? 
Banu says 80 million years ago. Very good. Zaid agrees. Fantastic. Yeah. That is uh, the correct answer. Yeah, it's 80 million years ago. 80 million years ago. Very good. Good for those of you who caught that. So, yeah, they say T Rex lived approximately 80 to 65 million years ago. Okay, um, next question. Tyrannosaurus Rex lived during which time? The Jurassic period, the late Cretaceous period, or the late Triassic period? When was it alive? Which one of those periods? And the correct answer is B. Uh, Jurassic period, that's just for the Hollywood movie. Okay, something to know. <laughs> the uh, T-Rex did not live during the Jurassic period. Um, the T-Rex lived during the late Cretaceous period. Okay. And uh, the reason why uh, in the Hollywood movie they say Jurassic Park is because it sounds better. I think uh, if the movie were called The Late Cretaceous Park, people would be like, The Late Cretaceous Who? I'm not going to go see a science movie. Uh, Jurassic Park just sounds much better. Jurassic Park. Dun, 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 dun. Sure. All right. Uh, but not true. So Late Cretaceous, B. Okay, B is the right answer. How tall was Tyrannosaurus Rex? Next question, 33. How tall was the T-Rex? 12 meters, 6 meters, 7 meters. And it's B again. 6 meters. Okay. Um, the speaker doesn't use the word tall. They say height. The T-Rex had a height of six meters. The T-Rex was six meters tall. Okay. All right. So let's keep going with some interesting knowledge about the T-Rex. Um, the theory which explains why fossils are found in very different regions of the world is called what? It's two words. Okay. And uh, Paranjay says it's called continental drift. Very nice. Nice vocabulary. Nice for catching that. Continental drift. Yeah, so the noun continent, okay, that's like North and South America, Asia, Europe, okay. Those are all continents, uh, all right? Continental is the adjective form. Um, you'll hear it like uh, continental travel, intercontinental travel. Okay, here it's continental drift. Drift means to kind of like swim or move. So continental drift means that these different continents were moving around over millions and millions of years. Zaid, yes, spelling does matter absolutely okay uh, theories are usually they don't have to be capital letters in english the name of a theory so it can be all lowercase continental drift okay but because we're referring to a name you can be on the safe side and use a capital letter okay so when you hear this called it means that this is a name, and when you have a name, you can absolutely use capital letters, okay? Yes, Vanessa, both words have to be correct to get the point. So um, if you write drift um, like that, that's wrong, then the whole is wrong, okay? So yes, you have to have both.
correct. Okay, you have to have the spelling correct on both, and you need both words correct to get the point. All right, here we go. So questions 35 to 40, it's a table completion. Uh, we're talking about evidence, implications, conclusions. Uh, the T-Rex had extremely short arms, yeah. Logic, right, if you have the picture, if you know what the T-Rex looks like. Arms are important for hunting. Now here, you soon realize that the debate is whether the T-Rex was a predator or a scavenger. And if the T-Rex had short arms, it means that likely the T-Rex was a scavenger. Very good. Uh, what is a scavenger? What is a scavenger? What is a scavenger? So Raghu says it's an animal that collects dead meat. Um, yeah, eats, eats meat, which is, it's, it's already dead. Yeah, eats dead animals. Um, if it's, uh, if it's plants, it's not a scavenger. If it's a plant, it's called a forager, forager. Okay. So scavenger is meat. Forager is plants like a squirrel, squirrel looking for nuts. Foraging for nuts, foraging for nuts. Okay, uh, strong sense of smell, able to detect carcasses. Uh, carcass is the dead animal, okay? So that's like the bones and the meat of the dead animal. That's the carcass. So able to detect carcasses from long distances. That's right, uh, Maxime, very good, distances. And of course, that means that it's likely a scavenger. So very good sense of smell. Although, in my opinion, I'm not a much of a anthropologist or a uh, archaeologist or a, uh, a zoologist, but I would say that that could also mean that they're a predator. Uh, it's good to smell from far away. Sharks are good at that. Uh, anyway, uh, don't bring your own ideas. Just answer what they tell you. Large serrated teeth. Able to tear through tough what? 38. Tough. CR7 guy, make sure you don't use the word tough. Just add the word skin. That's right. Tough skin. So skin. Skin is the correct word. Good. Uh, 39. If the animal is able to rip through tough skin of other animals, that must mean that the animal is likely a predator. Yeah. Predator means that they hunt. So here, you didn't have to get too clever. These words help you to identify these answers, okay? Because that's the conclusion about the animal. So careful with this type of question in the exam, all right? And the last one, uh, perhaps they were predators. Predator means to hunt and kill another animal. So perhaps they were predators. Uh, they didn't have to be careful with their teeth because the teeth were replaceable. That's right, very good, all those students who are saying, not sharp teeth, but replaceable teeth. Replaceable can be replaced. Replaceable teeth, okay? Very good. Students, count up your scores. If you have your um, marks from last week, from section one and two, that's great. Add them all together. And we'll check your band score. We'll check your total band score from last week's and this week's class. So count up how many you got from 40. Now, on our website, uh, Academic IELTS English Help or AEHelp.com, uh, at the bottom, you'll see a score calculator. Uh, let me darken up the screen so you can see what I'm seeing. There we go. So you see that score calculator that's at the bottom of the website. You can actually click on that. All of those are clickable links. And then uh, you have this uh, screen here where you can uh, check your score out of 40 and convert your raw score 
into your band score. Uh, so Vijaya says, I got 36. Uh, that's a band eight, Vijaya, band eight for 36. So as soon as you enter your raw score, you'll have your band score there. Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit more. Uh, make sure you're entering it for the listening section, not the reading, because it's different. Um, Zaid says 30. 30 is a band score seven. That's pretty good. Okay. Hikmatillo, 31. Still a seven, band seven. Okay. 37, Banu, is an 8.5. Okay. So, um, Bussy, 36 is still an eight. 36 to 37 is where the change happens. That's where you become an 8.5. Uh, Saul, Saul's got 33. 33 Saul is a 7.5 band, okay? So you can check your band scores on our websites at the bottom. And again, if you like our uh, lessons, if you like these videos, you can get lots, lots, lots more videos. Um, and you can use our app as well. Our website has lots of goodies, uh, computer-based exams, um, and... Uh, Fully interactive online course, over 100 hours of video lessons that you can choose from, plus you can use it through your app. And the general version is this with the green background. Uh, that's it for this class, students. For lots more help, join those websites, spend a couple dollars, save yourself a lot of headache, time, money. IELTS exams are expensive. And tomorrow I will be back with uh, task to finish for our members, Shang Hung, CR7 guy. Make sure you're in our members chat class tomorrow to finish up the essay. And um, also we will do a reading section for everybody. Uh, CR7 guy, you can always contact me through email, okay? Adrian at aehelp.com, all right? That's where you can send your questions. Have an awesome rest of your Wednesday. If it's come to an end, get some good sleep and have a fantastic start to your Thursday. Much love to all of you from beautiful Budapest. Bye for now.